I think I mentioned before that I'm a bit heavy on Corydoras this year, which is still true. I'm trying to space them out, but you're definitely going to see a trend here. I hope you don't mind. On the bright side, two of those species are from different genera than the quarries I've worked with before. I've been really eager to see how the breeding process for these somewhat more exotic species might differ from what I'm used to. Not to spoil the surprise, but in the case of these Aspidorus spilotus, the short answer is not much. It was pretty routine, with differences really only in scale. I'll show you what I mean by that. I started with a group of nine, and to my eyes that was three females and six males. I determined their sex the same way I would for quarries, which is entirely by size. Here you can see a male and female side by side, and notice the massive disparity in size. Once you know what to look for, you can spot this difference from any angle, but it's usually most obvious from above. The larger of the two is the female. At this point, she's grown to full size, she's eaten really well, and she's loaded up with eggs. Speaking of size, that's one of the characteristics of Aspidorus where they differ from most quarries. They're much smaller. That large female, for example, is only about an inch and a quarter. If you're looking for dwarf quarries, you might want to look into this species. To me, they retain more of the classic Corydoras aesthetic than the dwarf species do. They're just smaller. Imagine if you could take a big, dignified dog breed, shrink it down to a miniature size, but it didn't turn into a Shih Tzu. That's basically what you get out of Aspidorus. Another difference I noticed from quarries almost immediately is their off-the-charts activity level. They may look calm now, but they're not even activated. I'll show you how to do that. Because of their size, I wasn't as diverse with feedings as I usually try to be. For the time I've had them, they've eaten baby brine shrimp almost exclusively. And this, by the way, is how you activate the Aspidorus. The brine shrimp worked well to help them grow to their full size, and also to condition them for spawns. The time it took for the fish to mature and start spawning was much shorter than I expected. Usually when I bring in a new species of Corydoras, I count on it taking about six months for them to grow and reach sexual maturity, and that keeps proving itself to be true, for Corys. For these Aspidorus, it was about half that time. They actually caught me off guard. I didn't do anything special to encourage spawns, I just fed them and did normal water changes. I kept this tank at about 76 degrees, and if I was trying to encourage spawns, I would be adding fresh water with a temperature a few degrees lower. In this case, it apparently wasn't necessary. They don't seem to be picky about water parameters either. They've been happy to breed in water with moderate hardness and a pH of about 7.9. So far, I've only seen them spawn in the early hours of the morning before the sun comes out. I've tried a few times to record it, but they've been really determined to avoid spawning with the lights on. Instead, I just find eggs in the morning. Consistent with the quarries, they seem to have the same preference for placing their eggs in the direction of water flow. This cluster, for example, was above a sponge filter. I switched to a matten filter recently to help with filming, and several times they placed clusters on the front glass directly in front of the outflow. I didn't use a spawning mop in this instance, I just let them spawn on the glass, because the total number of eggs was relatively low, and that doesn't surprise me. As small as Aspidorus are in comparison to Cory's, the eggs are actually the same size. It makes sense to me that a single female wouldn't hold as many eggs at one time. After each spawn, I removed the eggs and tried to re-adhere them to the walls of one of my fry trays. This one is mounted on a 5-gallon tank, sitting at about 75 degrees, and with generally the same chemistry as the parent's tank, with one exception. I previously added some tannins to the water to help prevent fungal growth on the eggs. You might also notice a layer of sand on the bottom of this tray, and that part is new. You have to pause for a quick story so I can explain that a bit better. A couple of years ago, I got a chance to meet Eric Bodrock and ask him a few questions about breeding quarries. One of the things I asked him was how to prevent fin erosion, which I was seeing on some small percentage of my fry. I asked his opinion on causes and whether he thought microworms had anything to do with it. This was also just before I started working on the fry trays, and I was primarily using acrylic breeding boxes at the time. What he told me is that he doesn't think microworms have anything to do with those kinds of deformities. He asked what I was holding the fry in, and when I told him, he said that was probably the cause. That there's something about the smooth, flat surfaces of those breeding boxes and the films that develop on them that really don't work well for quarry fry that sit on the bottom. He recommended that if I'm going to use acrylic breeding boxes, that I throw a little sand on the bottom, that they would do better that way. It's only a small percentage of fry that I've ever had issues with, so I've just been sitting on that recommendation for the last couple of years, always keeping it in the back of my mind. I never wanted to scratch up my acrylic breeding boxes by putting sand in them, but these fry trays are kind of perfect for it. This time I decided to throw in some sand and just see what I see. So that's the reason for the sand. Back to it. The Aspidorus caught me off guard again when the eggs hatched after maybe three days, if that. 
I woke up on that third day to find the eggs burst open and fry scattered throughout the sand, some of them still working their way out of the eggs. I forget if I've ever told you this, but when I see this egg on the head thing, I think they look like they're wearing space helmets. That's about the depth of my internal monologue, fish wearing helmets. I also found that between the sand and the tannic water, the fry were much harder to see, so apologies in advance. As I usually do for Corys, I left the fry alone for the remainder of the day. The next morning I gave them some food, and I started with a fry powder mixed with water, and then dispersed through the tray. Enough for them to pick at throughout the day. This was fairly heavy-handed, so I think I just did this one more time after work. This is something I like to do for good measure before jumping right into brine shrimp, usually for a day or maybe two. I like to see their mouths get wider before switching completely to brine shrimp. That's usually somewhere on the second or third day, and you can see they have the same enthusiasm for brine shrimp as their parents. I had a series of spawns around this time, so you might notice a few different sizes in the tray. Ideally, I like to feed three times a day, morning, early evening, and just before bed. Sometimes it ends up being twice a day, but I tend to overfeed just a little bit in those cases so that there will be extra food for the fry to pick at throughout the day. I should mention at this point, I also found that the parents didn't seem interested in eating eggs or newly hatched fry. There were a good number that grew and survived to adulthood after hatching in the parents' tank. So if you're into colony spawning, this might be a good fish for you. If I skip forward about a month, you can see how much the fry grew in that time. I still feed baby brine shrimp a few times a day, and other than the occasional water change, it was no more complicated than you've already seen. Just rinse and repeat and wait for them to grow. I wanted to make a point of saying that the sand worked out very well. For everything but filming. Like I said, I don't usually have a problem with fry mortality, but I do lose a couple out of most batches, and this time I lost zero. That might be a first. Sand is kind of magical, and more specifically, I think it's uniquely hygienic for bottom dwellers. If I had to venture a guess, I would say it's owing to texture. The sand grains form an uneven surface, and also, they're constantly getting moved and churned around by water flow or by the fish themselves. There isn't an opportunity for that slimy layer of biological chaos to develop, as it often does in acrylic containers. Now, of course, any container can be kept clean with effort, but I like how the sand played out. Between the sand and the tannic water for hatching, it feels like this might be approaching some kind of ideal. And I don't say that lightly. I care very much about being able to film this process, and the sand and tannins are awful in that regard. I just can't argue with results. Around this size that you see here, I started introducing a dry food. A high-quality, krill-based nano pellet that they would find appetizing after being accustomed to live food. I get asked occasionally at what point I wean fish off of live foods, and the short answer is I usually don't. I always have brine shrimp hatching, and they're great at putting size on small fish, so they're always a staple. What I do is make sure to work in dry food at some point in their growth, just so that when they move to a new home, it's not the first time that they're seeing dry food. So admittedly, I have kind of a bad habit. Sometimes I keep fry in enclosures like this a little bit longer than I probably should. That is, specifically, because I get a deep satisfaction out of looking down at a writhing mass of fish that didn't exist a couple of months ago. That look-what-I-have-created moment. There are signs that it's time to move on to a larger space. Growth might slow down, and usually you can just see it and feel it. Once the juveniles have all the features of an adult but not quite the size, they're probably ready to move. This time the signs were less subtle. Here's how the Aspidorus told me. I would go to feed, and the number of fish just seemed off. Lower than it was the day before. Eventually I found about a third of them swimming in the tank below. I would catch them, put them back in the tray, but then the next day it would be half of them in the tank. Then almost all of them the day after that. They were learning. I set up a camera and found out how they were escaping. They were building up speed and launching themselves up the walls of my tray. They started by using the uplift tower, but were blocked by the cap. They did this for a long time, trying and failing repeatedly. Eventually, some of the larger ones started to adjust their approach and figure out just the right angle to make it up and over the edge. And as they did this, the other fish watched. And I watched them learn. I couldn't think of a better example of what to expect from Aspidorus. They're basically the kindergartners from recess. They're savages. I took the hint and moved them into a 20 long to finish growing out. This is another six weeks later, and they've grown to the same size as the parents when I first got them. I've been trying to decide what size I want to grow these to before selling them, and I think this is it. They're ready to move on and wreak havoc on someone else's life. So that's about it for the Aspidorus spilotus. For the next breeding video, I think it will either be Corydoras similis or Bozemani rainbows. 
The rainbows spawn first, but they grow like molasses, so I'm leaning towards the similis. Either way, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.